again, everybody. My name is Mike Petralia. It's episode 223 of the Patriots Beat on the CLNS Media Network. You can get us there at www.clnsmedia.com. Follow us on Twitter at CLNS Media and Facebook at facebook.com slash CLNS Media. It gives me a great deal of pleasure and it's a big thrill. I've been trying to get this gentleman on for a while now to join us on the Patriots beat. None other than the man who was selected with the 84th pick in the fourth round of the 1991 NFL draft. He's also co-host of the Zoe and Bertrand show on 98.5, the sports hub and color analyst of the Patriots radio network, Scott Zolak. Scott, Zoe, thanks for joining us. Craig, it's good to be on with you, man. I, now, 223, if you tried 222 other times before you got me on. I tried, uh, let's see, probably uh, I, I came on at about 2.05. Uh, and oh, okay. And been trying to get you on for pretty much since the start of the season, since I've uh, taken over the responsibilities uh, of this tremendous podcast on the CLNS Network. So uh, it is great to have you on the podcast, I can tell you that much. We're going to have some Good fun. Going, man. I see all the time. I see all the time at the stadium. It's just like it's a, it's quickly in passing because we're both very busy. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I tried to get you, and the first time I tried to get you, by the way, uh, it was Halloween. It was one of the dumber asks I've ever made of a guest because I'm like, wait a minute, it's Tuesday night, it's Halloween, right. Zoe has a family, that was not a good idea. Three kids, three kids, two of which still go trick-or-treating, and you're asking me to call, come on your podcast Pretty on dumb. Halloween, I'm like, dude, Halloween's like my second favorite holiday, like, we dress up, we decorate dogs, we scare the shit out of the kids, <laughs> can I say shit? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you I could, absolutely I could. can. It's not like my radio show, Jesus. Correct. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of my more favorite holidays, yeah. So I gotta, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start with a hard hitting question and you know what that hard hitting sure. question is. I don't when even know. did don't want to lose your love tonight from the outfield, the Josie song first become a part of your tradition at Patriots games. It's like a red light in the cigar cigar at Celtics right. games. When did that become a Patriots tradition at Gillette Stadium for you? And, and, and this is exactly what we don't – we do not want this to become Sweet Caroline. And and I've pleaded with the people over there, and they kind of wanted to wedge it in, you know, end of the third quarter or maybe when – you know, it's got to be when the game's in hand or it's the, it's the score or the play or the turnover that puts the game in hand, right? Boom, ball game over at that point. Um, this thing took off. Oh, God, a couple of years ago. But it originated. It's a great question. It's the first time somebody's asked me this. So the guy that produces our midday show, he's, his name is Jim Wild. He lives yeah. down in Warwick. Jim, Jim worked with me down at the score with Gresh when I first started doing nine, you know, six, 6 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning radio down there. And I was just doing radio for benefits. Uh, they threw me on and I swore, I think, seven times in the first <laughs> five segments. They, they never gave me any guidelines. Uh, didn't tell me you could offend Italians down in down in uh, Atwell's Ave, and I, I did that uh, brilliantly. Had to apologize to a lot of people after that. And they just they just threw a guy on with no no training whatsoever. I mean, they just thought, hey, okay, I'm gonna go in there and be, talk like it's a locker. And I said, sure, no problem, I can do that. And um, Jim figured it out through about the first two or three years of working with me that by noon on a Friday. I start to tend to lose focus. And it really started when we were at the sports hub. So hmm. started with Tangway and we're doing it. And then, you know, a couple, couple years into it, you know, then we made the move to go to Gresham. It's me and Beetle now. But um, it was back to the early Tangway days. Like somewhere around noon on a Friday, I would start to lose focus. And Jim knows I like – Jim has worked for me forever, and he knows I love 80s music. Eddie right. Money, you know, it's uh, – shoot, Bon Joe, you name it, uh, Def Leppard, anything. For whatever reason, Jim played – Jim played uh, Your Love by the Outfield at noon, and it got me fired up. And it was like, it was a spring or summer day. You know, so it's one of those like 80 degree Friday days, and I snapped out. And from that point on, he started playing it. We used to do the chicken fried thing at, yeah. by Zach Brown Bam at 12 on Friday. Right. Then Jim switched it to Your Love by uh, the Outfield, and this thing has been a hit. And it carried over to the Patriot Games. And for people who listen to our show, a lot of people listen to our show, obviously go to the Patriot Games. And this thing, divisional round against the Ravens, when they were down 14 twice, yep. 
I mean, I could literally feel the, 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 the freaking stadium shake when he would play this thing. And it went on and on. And that was probably the best moment of it. And I just, I just don't want to turn this thing into Sweet Caroline. You know? I, I, one of those corny, corny Red Sox anthems that are like wedged in end of the seventh. Yeah, but you know what? I, I think it's different because I think the crowd realizes that the Patriots are doing really well right. when that they hear that exactly. song, as opposed to at Red Sox games, and and whether it's Pink Hats or whether it's just the the casual baseball fan who's taking in a Fenway game because it's the touristy thing to do. Right. When you hear Sweet Caroline and the Red Sox are getting their ass beat like 8-1 in the bottom of the – that's the last thing you want to hear, I think, as if I'm a Red yeah. Sox fan. That, and, yeah. and I totally I, I see love, where you're I going. I love Bill Diamond. I love Bill Diamond, Crackling Rosie, all that stuff. Right. Sweet Caroline's one of my favorites. The Red Sox have made me, and the way they do it at Fenway, made me hate Sweet Caroline. And we get that a lot. I mean, it is 90, 90 to 10 to, to favor the banishment of Sweet Carolina Fenway to anybody we talk to regarding that team. All right, let's transfer. Because they play, you, know, you can't yeah. play when you're getting your ass kicked. You're right. No, you, do you, it. You, nor should you, because I, I don't think, of, no. especially in football, and, and l- let's face it, the, the football fans' uh, mentality is a lot different than yeah. the baseball fans' mentality, and maybe that's part of right. it, too. It's a different game. I get that. I, I totally get that. But even in football, like, I don't want to do it every game. I don't want to do it in a preseason. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd say do it three to five times a, a year. Maybe right. in a big game. Maybe if you got Pittsburgh at home or, you know, uh, shoot, you know, opening night against uh, against Kansas City, Banner, something like that. Or play, It's big for playoffs. You know, playoffs, you're advancing, you're excited. You know, pretty much a game's in hand. That's when you know, okay, we're going to next week. We start thinking about next week. And, that's sort of where it came. Jim did it to wake me, wake my ass up because I'm adult ADD and I'm all over the place half mm-hmm. the time. You know, I'm, I'm overexcitable. Um, and it's just to like kind of hone me back in and like, hey, I'm going to play this, so you're going to pay attention. And that's, that's kind of how it evolved. And it's taking on a new life down at Gillette. I gotta, so let's transition to the last time we heard that song played. It was six and a half minutes to go. Uh, the Patriots uh, finally took care of business and, and beat the Miami yeah. Dolphins. What are your impressions of this team, where they're at? They're 9-2. and two. They've won seven straight. It's yep. remarkable to me, Zoe, every single year that they start off a little bit slow, 2-2. Uh, two and two. I think they've started 2-2 two and two, uh, three of the last seven years, something right. like that. And the last couple of times they've started 2-2, two and two, they've won the Super Bowl. So, you know, you've, you've got to think that this team – progresses during the course of a season better than I think any team in the NFL of the last 20 years. It's just, it's remarkable to me how they don't panic down in Foxborough. Yeah. I, I'm happy for the defense. I mean, I could sit here and we could do, we could do a four hour podcast on the offense, but I think people get tired. Right. And that's the sad part is you take for granted what Brady's done. Brady's remarkable at 40. I mean, that's, that's a whole nother, whole nother podcast. I mean, I, they'd probably be two and four, two and six without Brady. It's why they, it's why Garoppolo's not here. You know, that, you know, your, your chances to win are with this guy. Um, but the defense got, you know, obliterated, not literally on the field, which they did the first couple of games, but talk shows, you know, articles, beat writers. And it sucks when you're not doing well as a unit and you got to stand there in the locker room and answer questions while the offense is doing well. We know we're the unit that's, Kind of dragging along. It reminds me of last year when we went up to San Francisco. Where everybody's questioning them, but it's never going to turn around. And boom, it pops, it does, and then you go on a Super Bowl run. Um, you know, this thing happened years ago with Revis and Browner. And at some point around week seven, eight, they tend to start to find themselves. Bill did this with a keep to leave when they traded for him. Instant impact when he got here. You start to get yourself cranked up defensively for that second half of the year. And it's really, you know, Bill always says it too, you know, your season starts Thanksgiving on. That's where you got to be playing your best football. Even at 07 year, I think they peaked early. You know, they they started to flatline a little bit after weeks, what, 12, 13? And, I thought they were beat up that year, so I mean, I thought toward the end pressure of Pressure got to them too. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you get tired of the undefeated talk, you know. It, it builds up to it builds up for you, but they're, they're just fun to watch now because, you know, you, you – you go on the road, and there aren't many teams that can pick it up on an organization, go stay out in Colorado Springs for a week, you know, play in a tough spot in Denver. That was a tough spot. I don't care who the quarterback was, what they were. They still had to leave in Harris and Vaughn Miller. They got backs that can run. They got receivers that can, that can catch the ball. Um, 
it's just, you know, they've, they've handled their business better than anybody in the league. And it's just it's fun calling games because I could – I know the offense a little bit, same terminology, so I could sort of advance and see some things coming, um, you know, especially with the motion. And, you know, it's fun watching them use backs now. They've got backs now that, you know, they can bring in, you know, three backs or, or four tight ends and go regular and, and super big. And you've got the defense subbed out to where, okay, we got bigs and that boom at the snap, they're an empty. No other, league, no other team in the league can do it, not even Pittsburgh. So, so- – it's just fun watching them sort of come together. I'm glad you brought up those two points because um, my next two bullet points that I've written down here, Stefan Gilmore versus Darrell Revis in 2014. Let me start here, So I went here with Bill Belichick uh, today on the conference call, and you probably can guess what Bill said to me when I asked him about any potential similarity between Darrell Revis and Stefan Gilmore, because like you said a a little while ago, Revis had that adjustment period for pretty much the first half of 2014. And we've seen, uh, we saw how much Gilmore struggled at the beginning of the year, whether it was communication, whether it was scheme and, and trying to understand what the Patriots wanted him to do and the secondary coaches wanted him to do uh playing corner and bill said told me look i don't know about all of that i mean every player is different whether it's talib whether it's revis whether it's gilmore every yeah. player is different but i will tell you that the coaching staff works their tail off to make sure gilmore got to the point where he's more comfortable and Bill, right. you know, spent the second half of the answer talking about the job Josh Boyer has done, uh, getting Gilmore much more comfortable in the system. And he's been better. He has been better. It seems like he's better in man situations, but you know, when Darrell Rivas came here, he had already Darrell Rivas a football life on NFL network. Hmm. You know, Darrell's playing a player. We knew about Darrell. He was the enemy. You know, you know the jet games, um, he was the best cover corner since Dion. You know, and I, I think Ty Law's up there with those guys, too. I play with Ty. I think Ty, I think Ty had all the skill sets. Physical, covers. Some guys won't hit. And I didn't think Dion would hit that much, you know, but you know, Ty would hit. Darrell would mix it up, but Darrell's balance and his, his ability to just stay steady and play steady and his instincts alone were, were phenomenal. I look at him and, and, and Gilmore is completely different players. Gilmore's more of like a browner build. He's taller, he's longer. I think like he plays a little pissed off, which is good. I remember yeah. him at camp. Remember we were getting the scraps with Edelman and yes. you know, we're not friends out here, you know, and I'm like, holy crap, we got a good one here. But when they signed him day one, it kind of shocked everybody because that's not what they do. And I kind of had to recall like, okay, well, what did he do in Buffalo? And I called the games against him. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. We hung, you know, what, 42, 37, 50. We, we hung a lot of points in Buffalo. Chris Hogan got him on double moves, all that stuff. Everybody I'm remembers that play do. in Buffalo, yeah. by the way. Yeah, where Gilmore is turning around at his teammates. And, and right. that's what, you know, I but, think a lot of Patriots fans were wondering in the first half of the year or first quarter of the year, is that the guy we got? Yeah, I think I think Terrell was the best they've, they've had other than Ty Law. But don't sell Keith to leap short. I love the way that guy competes. He was hysterical last week. I know that's not good for the league and the league doesn't want that. But we were out in Denver and <laughs> – I watch Bill and Ernie every free game, and they got the same damn routine. Ernie goes out early. He watches everything, the punts, this and that. And then, right. yeah, they come together as a unit, and they bring the offense versus defense. Everybody's huddled down in the end zone. And Denver's leaving the field. So their warm-up is already done. They're going into the locker room. Bill, for the first time in my career covering this team, leaves his huddle and goes and seeks a keep to leave out on the sideline to embrace him and hug him and talk to him before he goes into the tunnel. I never saw that before. That's so that goes to show you the respect he has for that player. I mean, that's that's a little thing. Remember when Walker, the, the player, had an illegal hit? It was a dirty hit. Like, he went to the wall for a team. I, I know he loved to keep to leave. And um, yeah, it just didn't work out here. You know, he ended up getting a lot of money. And so the Patriots do. They let you go test the market. If you find the money, you're going to find elsewhere. And if not, you're coming back. What about Dion Lewis and Rex Burkhead? I know you touched on them a, a little bit, Zoe, but um, what they have given the Patriots uh, the last couple of weeks, I think, is the, the perfect one-two punch because I think if you're going to keep defenses honest uh, in terms of trying to 
you know, go balls to the wall to get to Brady. You've got to have guys either that can catch. I know the screen game has not been real effective, but you've got to have guys who can, um, you know, either be capable of catching that, that short pass. I know James White does a lot of that. Or right. you've got to have guys who can run the ball between the tackles or run the, in any situation. And I think those two can do that. Yeah, screen screen's the toughest thing to, to, to run, and not only run, but call it, because you, you, you got to call it right against the right defense. you got to have a good rush upfield. you got to have the quarterback be able to bait the guy. You've got to execute getting your linemen out, and those guys trip over each other's feet sometimes, and it's not only smooth, and it's timing. Everything is timing predicated in that screen game, and you got to have a back that has the knack to do it. I think we've known through 12 games now that Brandon Cooks is not a good down-the-line screen guy. You know, throw it out to him. He's so antsy and he's so gung ho that he wants to catch it and just go. Where Danny Amendola and you know Edelman had to pay have the patience for it. It's just I think they got some round pegs trying to fit in some square holes now. But Burkhead reminds me. I played with Kevin Turner for yep. a while, and Kevin Turner and Rex Burkhead got a lot of the same traits. Except Rex is a little more explosive. He's more of a quicker guy. Where Kevin's more of a hard nosed guy, but Kevin can catch the shit out of the ball. I think Rex can do that too. I don't think we've really saw the tip of the iceberg here yet for, with Rex. I mean, they can run him on angles, seams. You know, now with Bennett being out, I think Burkhead could be that seam guy opposite Gronkowski that you know, safeties and you know, are going to have to worry about. And the best thing here is, you know, Deion Lewis played a ton in the preseason. You're thinking, okay, they're showcasing him. They're trying to trade him. And that, and he just kept his mouth shut and worked. And he's formed into the number one feature back on his team. And it's kept James White healthy. And, you're going to get a game here or two down a stretch where you might be down seven and you got to put on Brady's back and you're going to have white in the huddle with him. Cause that's going to, you know, absolutely. He may get, he got one target last week. He may, there's going to be a game where he's going to get 12 down the road here. It could be in Pittsburgh. You know, Gillsley's a healthy scratch. This thing will work itself out. Okay. Somebody's going to get mixed up. You know? So what's going to become of Mike Gillisley? I have no clue. I don't None. know. I don't know. I mean, I mean that's probably not, that's one of the big that's one of the big uh, I think surprises to a lot of people. Yeah, that I think he would have been. He, he thought he thought he should have been your number one back, right? And like your bell cow, he should be your first down guy. James White your third, Dion your third, and Rex sprinkled in between there. And this thing has completely worked itself backwards almost to where your smallest guy is now your feature back, and but he's also your strongest runner. Um, I just think he'll at least a step below what, what Garrett gave you. You know, Legarrett was pretty damn good. Legarrett had a good knack understanding for what this running game was and how to find holes and run hard and get to daylight. And Gillisley has yet to really step out of a tackle, even in open field. So that's that's concerning. All right, speaking with the play-by, or I should say the color analyst, the very popular and one and only color analyst of the Patriots Radio Network, Scott Zolak. Listen up, Hoops fans. Basketball season is back, and now that your favorite hardwood heroes have returned to action, it's time for you to put your fantasy knowledge to the test to win huge cash prizes. Every night, playing one-day fantasy basketball at DraftKings.com. At DraftKings, there are so many ways to play. Choose from public contests with huge cash prizes or private contests where you can compete against your friends. They've got even beginner and casual contests where you'll play against people of similar skill level. The best part? You'll get to draft a new team each day, and drafting a team is arguably the best part of fantasy. The only thing better? Winning cash doing it. Just ask Dan from St. Louis or Jeremy from Austin. They both turned a $3 entry into a thousand bucks. Huge cash prizes and bragging rights await only at DraftKings. Use code CLNS at DraftKings.com to play for free with your first deposit for your share of $10,000 in total prizes tonight. Do not wait. Use code CLNS at DraftKings.com now to choose your lineup and you can seriously cash in tonight. That's code CLNS only at DraftKings.com. The game inside the game, minimum $5. Deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Once again, talking with the one and only Zoe, Scott Zolak of the Zoe and Bertrand Show on 98.5, the Sports Hub, and obviously uh, the uh, color analyst along with Bob Sosi on Patriots radio broadcast. I want to get to something now that is one of my favorite things you do every week, Zoe, and that is... What's that? 
you are the host of the Bellastrator, the Belichick <laughs> Breakdowns. And I got to tell you, I am somebody who loves the X's and O's. And these are the things that I like asking Bill when I get a chance on those conference calls yeah. or after a game. X's and O's, because those are the things he wants to talk about. When you get Bill talking about something he wants to talk about, that's when I think you see the great personality come out in Bill. How much fun is it to do those every week with Bill? That's good when you win. I mean, thank God they've won tw- on average 12, 13 games a year. So <laughs> that helps. We're having 13, sure. 13 good Wednesdays. Yeah, you know, we take that every Wednesday down uh, down at Gillette, you know, early in the morning. And mm-hmm. the cool thing is he, he takes the time to pick these out. And not only pick hmm. the plays out, he's also embraced the technology to where I'm going to shadow box this guy. I'm going to circle this guy. I'm going to label this instead of just writing on it, you know. So as, as, as technology advances and, and makes things easier to cut and splice things, I mean, I remember we laughed about this because I was telling him last week, he got pissed off because he forgot to put one of the plays in. And one of the plays was a great punt rush that this team had that they were facing last week. So in come, you know, they're coming in here and they're, they're, you got a punt rush on and it's fourth and nine or fourth and eight. I think there's no way in hell. Okay. So I'm looking down to return. And thank God Bob caught Ebner on the sneak or on the, on the fake punt. Right. Because nobody to write mine calls fake punt fourth and eight, fourth and nine, but Bill, the previous Wednesday highlighted you know, they're pretty devastating at rushing the punt is Miami. So that thing was already in effect by the time I was in there Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. So it was already game plan. Some, at some point, Monday or Tuesday with Joe Judge, they, you know what, if we got a fake punt here, we're calling it. We're calling this sucker because we see something. So Bill diagrams that, and he goes through it. And, you know, he gets a kick out of it. He does because it's, it's something that works for him in practice. The ones he loves is when, you have the exact same formation in practice. You saw this in, you know, three games of glory or football life or whatever it is when, you know, the Super Bowls where Ernie Adams would draw something up, you know, the, the right. Carroll play of the, the pick and boom, there it is right there. The Malcolm go Malcolm did it wrong this way. And then he plants the foot. Bill loves that type of stuff. So anytime we can do that, he, he, he'll be there and he'll talk about that, that specific play for four, four minutes or so, but you're right. And I know, he kind of scoffed at a question by Karen Gurria again this past week. And I don't think there was any attention to make Karen look bad there. No, I don't either. Um, and I was said, front row when, when Karen asked that question, that is Bill's way of saying, I know waiting. people are thinking this. Yeah. This is how yep. I feel about Tom playing. Cause he knows he gets this. We question. talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about it on the broadcast. We're like you've got to get him out. You're trying to knock him out of this game, but Based on if, – if they played the way they played against Denver and Oakland, I think Tom would have been out of there with maybe eight minutes left. I really do. Really? Because Horner played last week. Bill, Bill was content taking him out of the Raider game. You know, and it's still a lopsided game at that point. I know it was 33-8, to eight, but still, um, he's waiting for that question because he knows everybody's thinking it. Correct. And there's probably people in his locker room thinking, well, why don't you take Tom out? You know, look how beat up. Look how... I think, Bill, that's an indicator for him that, okay – we played like crap at times, and we shut down on offense where we had, what, three consecutive three and outs and looked like crap in the third quarter. I'm not going to send a message to my team to where I'm going to take the gas, foot off the gas, and take this guy out indicating, okay, guys, game, set, match. We're done here today. That's a sign to his team that I'm not happy with what we're doing. That's why they were in on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. You know, for the last couple of weeks, they've been in on Wednesdays. Give them three days off. They throw them a bone. They're playing well. Right. He's not happy with something he saw in the Miami game, whether it's defense, whether it's offense. He, he won't tell you. He won't tell me. You know? But there's a reason he did what it did. And whether it was Karen, whether it was you, whether it was going to be Mike Reese, somebody was going to get the end of that question. Like, well, what, are you, what, are you, what are you looking at? We don't look at it that way. And he's just sending a message to the team, like, game ain't over. It's 60 minutes. He'll no. do that for – he does that for a reason. He does well, not intend to – make Karen Gurria look bad. And that, that, was, that was something not. interesting. And he respects – yeah. people should know who are sure listening to this. People – I mean, Bill really, really respects Karen Garigian a lot. And Karen was on the conference call with us, you know, on uh, Tuesday. And, you know, Bill has all the res- – you can tell the way Bill uh, um, answers a question uh, many times, the kind of respect that he has for that reporter or that reporter's. 
uh, question. I know Michael Hurley uh, tweeted this out, and I thought it was pretty hilarious on Tuesday. And I know Tommy Curran, um, you know, quoted the tweet uh, when Belichick inserted Matt Castle. You remember the game, 2007? Yeah, Miami against I the Dolphins. I don't, I don't know. What, I didn't see the tweet. All you got to do is tell me the Miami game where he spun around and Jason Taylor with the pick or pick six or whatever it was, and boom, Brady went right back in. Correct. And Belichick's yeah. answer was priceless that night after the game where he's like, well, if, yeah, it, uh, we're up whatever it was, 21 points, uh, but another turnover, and it's a 14-point game in uh, the middle of the fourth quarter. You don't have to tell me I was there. It was the quintessential be- Belichick right. answer to right. taking Brady out of the game. They blew that. They blew that play dead. It should have been a twenty-one nothing game. You had Aaron snap, and instead of being twenty-one nothing, it was fourteen-seven. And that's how quickly he looks at it as this thing could change that quick. Correct. And he's got a lot of he's got a lot of young players stepping up now to play in roles where you got some starters down, and you know the veterans are playing rolling eyes at some of the stuff. But you know they they know what the deal is. They know what the deal is. He's sending messages here. I want to uh, focus now on the, on the start of your career, Zoe. And sure, you know, obviously, when you came in to the Patriots, it was a very uh, tumultuous period in the franchise. Right? It was before yeah. Kraft took over the team. And what do you remember the most about the Patriots at in 1991 when you came in? Yeah, and how do you characterize that organization at that point in time, even before Bill Parcells came on board? Crappy facilities, you know, not really uh, learning much. Now I could say not learning much, but when you're, when you're a rookie and that, this is no disrespect to coach McPherson or anybody that you have. But right. once I had Bill Parcells and then I, these are the coaches I had as head coach. I had Dick McPherson initially, then it was Bill Parcells. Then it was Pete Carroll. Then it was Jimmy Johnson. So those final three all won Super Bowls. And, you know, when you have those three and you see how things are done and how a guy commands the room or how you're supposed to teach it, and how you're supposed to walk around on eggshells and you know, have the fear of losing your job if you're not good or you don't produce, then you kind of rethink the way it was at the beginning. And that's what I did. And that's, that's why I say that. But, I mean, it was not good when I got here. The locker rooms were bad. My high school locker room was nicer. I mean, we stayed at the damn ends on Lodge the night I was drafted. You know, the real 12 round draft at that time. And I took a three hour ride from um, Logan Airport, flew in on a freaking 5 30 p.m. flight on a Friday in late April when it was raining. <laughs> Just, you know, it's like, where are we going? And I'll tell you what, that, that stadium became intimate, though. And Parcells and Bledsoe changed all that. They changed the culture. And that place became noisy. The fans started to come around, and you just saw. You know, an environment that was reinvigorated because football meant something. It just didn't seem like football was important, and we were kind of laughing stock prior to that. And that's a transition period. A lot of teams go through that, you know. When did you realize, um, uh, not to cut you off, Zoe, but when did you realize yeah. Parcells and Bledsoe were the tran- transformative duo that could do what they did with the Patriots at that in 1993? Uh, first time I played catch with Drew, kind of knew, like, okay, he's stinging my hands. And, you know, he played catch with everybody, and I was in I was in Maryland with O'Donnell and those guys, but nobody threw the threw the ball like Bledsoe. And I was around Marino. You could see Marino throw it. You see Elway and those guys. And that was you know the, the, the middle of the '80s class of quarterbacks that were were peaking at that time in the league. And it was a Viking game when we were down a ton and we were getting our ass kicked. And I just remember being in the locker room at halftime and they're trying to draw shit up on the board and this and that. I look at Ray Perks. I'm like, hey, Ray. This kid loves a two minute trail. Just put him in the gun and turn turn this kid loose. Just put it on. What do we have to lose? I mean, we're down by a ton of points. And I hear Par- Parcells looks up and gives me a look like, what the heck are you looking at? Like, what, what, are you, what are you saying? He goes, you know what? I, it kind of makes sense. You know, and then they huddle on that. And they go, all right, here's what we're going to do. Everybody up. We're going to go two minute. <laughs> you know, and it's like it was their idea. <laughs> they were just trying to come together with some plays to get a drive going. I'm like, screw the drive. Put the kid in the gun and let him call the play. That's what he's comfortable doing. Any quarterback in a, in a two-minute situation, when you put him in a gun, is going to call the plays he knows he can hit. Instead of, okay, here's a play. We're going to do it by design. And if it works, it works. If not, we're going to try and call another one. And, you know, and it's just something clicked there. 
something clicked there. And, and Drew had a toughness about him, too. He played hurt with a lot of injuries nobody knew about. You know, the pin in the finger and all that just seemed like, God damn, for six years I was never going to get a chance to play. <laughs> and it took a pin, you know, in his finger and for Brady, you know, basically almost dying and getting his lung punctured to, to get in the damn game. So it's, he had a certain toughness about him, and uh, it was a pleasure to play with him. Um, you – played with the following court or you played at Maryland and the following quarterbacks I know you mentioned Neil O'Donnell Frank Reich and Boomer Esiason do you have close relationships with all of them I I know Frank pretty well from seeing him in Buffalo you know when we would play and he was always backing up Jim Jim Kelly there and I kind of keep in touch and he started coaching I see Boomer all the time with the radio stuff in the Westwood one he's always doing games you know, Boomer, it's a joke in Maryland. Boomer and I, they had to weld two helmets together to fit both our heads. We got the <laughs> biggest heads, I think, to ever play the position. Um, but he's got nice hair, you know, nice blonde hair. So his is kind of hidden a little better. But so, um, it's funny. We, we laugh and joke, but uh, he was he was a classic, man. He owned the campus. It was boom, boom, I'll go to the lights. And he had a hell of a career, man. It's fun, it's fun watching him. And he's one of the best talk show hosts, you know, in sports radio. So it's great for him. So you may or may not know this about me. I'm a Cincinnati native. And I got to tell you, Boomer Esias and still when he and I know he's you know in New York and and uh, doing the radio yeah. thing in in New York, but he is bigger than life in Cincinnati. Yeah. and I'll never oh, forget, yeah. you know, the 34 seconds, the Montana pass over the middle, and how much it it broke Boomer's heart. And I I'll tell you what, when I still when I see him, I saw him at halftime of the Super Bowl in Houston, and yeah. you know we still talk about that drive, that Montana drive, and he's like. You know, damn it! I knew as soon as we right. gave him the. It's like Brady, when you give a guy the ball with you know three minutes to go, and he had to go ninety-two yeah. yards, he was going to get the job done. But I, Boomer Esiason to me is one of the great personalities uh, in football today. That you know, I, I really enjoy being I mean, around had, him. He had the strike, he had the strike, and everything. And he and Sam Weiss were great. Weiss took the mic. Hey, this is Cleveland. Grow up, you know all that stuff. And, we used to love going to Cincinnati. We'd always go to Montgomery Inn to get the ribs. You know, and they always had you, – you guys always had that, what, spaghetti with the chili on it? That it's is – yeah, thing. Skyline or Gold Star. I actually asked uh, – Skyline. It's Skyline. That's the one we went to. Yes, and I asked Rex Burkhead yeah. after the uh, Dolphin game after, after on Sunday. I Before uh, he did an interview with me, I asked him, okay, Rex, only one question before we begin this interview. Right. Skyline or Gold Star? And he said, please, I'm from Texas. Neither. <laughs> and, and and his point was well taken, but, you know, eventually he said Skyline. Uh, one more thing about Maryland. I'm sure, sure it hurts you when you see the final score 66-3 to on Saturday against Penn State. Yeah. Do, do you really be- believe Maryland at this point uh, should be back in the ACC and not in the Big Ten? I do. I, I don't think they're a Big Ten team. I, it's a shame the way all these conferences now get reclassified and um, I know why they do it. They do it for money. It's become a basketball thing. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, and then you get to, you know, instability with the program. I and mean, I, I play, I, I knew Kevin Plank, you know, he invented Under Armour, the amount of funding you have, you know, and the different uniforms and what he's done to expand facilities there has been great. The basketball program has been good, but you know, not have that tradition to recruit a great quarterback kind of kind of things. And a quarterback at the collegiate level has changed. It's all read option crap now. Right. And it's a shame to see that, you know. So, I don't know. It's it's I'm kind of torn because I understand times change. But you would always have the six foot five quintessential drop back guy. We've had that for years there. And then now all of a sudden there's the, there's this fork. Yeah, I just think it's too bad because Maryland has had a great tradition of football, and I think in the ACC they it was just a better fit, and I think they could probably recruit better and stronger and a different type of uh, quarterback and different different talent. But going up, recruiting against your conference, I think, and I don't think a lot of you know casual football fans who aren't really into the college scene understand this. When when you are in a conference like that. Uh, and I had Steve Odazio tell me this, you're, you're recruiting against the other schools in the conference. That's why we make such a big deal of the other schools right. that we're playing every week in the ACC because that is your competition in the recruiting grounds. Yeah, it is. And it, I, I just remember, man, uh, you know, Jerry Sandusky. I know the issues that Sandusky had at Penn State, but I was a Pennsylvania kid, Pittsburgh, and Sandusky started recruiting me when I was eighth grade. He came in my house once a month. I had, Meatballs at Paterno's house, and 
you know, you know, Lou Holtz at Notre Dame or you know, whoever the hell is recruiting you. you know, Jimmy Johnson recruited me to go to Miami. Schnellberger went to Louisville. It doesn't seem like you have, other than Nick Saban, you know, Les Miles has gone from LSU. Um, you got the guy, what the hell's his name at Michigan State? Um, oh, uh, uh, the, uh, Nick D- uh, D'Antonio. Yeah, D'Antonio. <laughs> Can't remember the damn name. Like, who's the big coaches now? You know, we, we, you tell me. Urban, you tell me. I mean, you know, they're, cha- they're changing. They're changing Texas. They're changing Oklahoma all the time. It's not Stoops anymore. B. Carroll's gone. He's gone to the pros. It's time for I think Nick Saban to go to pro ball, and um, it's almost like Nick's been lost down there. Well, and and Urban at, at Ohio State. Yeah, correct. Yeah. One more question, and and it, it's I only ask this because Belichick after the game the other after the game the other night was asked by Mike Reese about his good friend Greg Schiano. And I think what happened with Greg Schiano when we're talking about the college culture is pretty despicable. And, you know, at least Tennessee did Schiano a favor by showing their colors um, to Schiano that they wouldn't, they wouldn't have had his back long-term anyway. Yeah. But I thought that was pretty bad, what Tennessee did. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It's nice to nice – to, uh, to pretty much smear the uh, reputation of a coach and uh, for Bill to put his neck out on the line for guy like Greg. And I hope he takes, I hope he takes Tennessee for a lot of money and I hope they got to pay him. And I hope the next guy goes there is not going to be the right guy for them because he doesn't want to step in a situation where sort of, uh, you know, he has that wind spot mentality and we're all sensitive to every single thing. And it's just, it's crazy the way this world is today. It's just, you, know, you could sit there and have the complaint of one person, and next thing you know, all you got to get is two or three, and then this next person's out of a job. It's um, sort of taking away a toughness to the work ethic of a, of a good football coach and you know what he could do and probably do a great job for that program. That would have been a good spot for him, been a great spot for him. Let, let's end on a, on a brighter note. Mike Tomlin, sure. you know Bill Belichick would never have done <laughs> with right. um, Tony Dungy what Mike Tomlin did the other night. Right. Not in a million years would he have done that, but you got to admit, Zoe, that that game in Pittsburgh, we can do this, the Patriots can't, and Bill won't do this, yeah. but we can look ahead to that game and how much fun yeah. that's going to be and what it's going to mean um, to you know the it's Patriots. Two-team can- race. Yes, it yeah. is. Two-team race. I had Kansas City dead two weeks ago. We, we talked about Mike Tomlin and what he said for two days now on the show. I think he's 100% correct. And the reason I like it is because it works for his team. You know, that those guys like him. They play hard for him. Um, he's sort of a player's coach. I'll break the elephant in the room. And, you know, that, that sort of bravado, I think it adds to it. I think it adds to the, AC, you know, the AFC rivalry between these two teams. Not that it's not, what, not lopsided because it is right now. But nobody in this Patriots organization will address it. But Pittsburgh will, and it will add stuff for that game. But Tomlin's right. And that game will determine where, you, where the second game is going to be played. He's 100% right with everything he said. So, in other words, he's providing the Rex Ryan element only with a It's team. good for the league. Right. It's good for the league that somebody talks about it. You know I mean? How many times are you like, oh, we're not going to worry about the next game? We're all, we're all worried about just the next game. It's such the, you know, it's, it's the right thing to say, but it's such the boring cliche, so to speak. And in today's world, we want, we want the big sound bite. We want the, ooh, that's something that's different. And Tom gave it to you. And I don't think it's different. I think he's right. Everybody in this damn you watch this league every week. There's two teams in the AFC. It's them and Pittsburgh. That's it. Nobody else. There's. I don't think there's a third. No, I, I really I, don't. Uh, it's, I would have said maybe Jacksonville or Tennessee on the right day, but I just I don't see that. And Tennessee could barely beat Indy the other day. I, I think you're right. right, Zoe. It's a two team league. I got to tell you, Zoe, it's right. been a pleasure. Um, this exceeded all expectations. Good. And I'd love right. to have it's you good. on sometime down the road. Again, this was really a lot of fun. Hang on there, Zoe. I just want to get this mention in. Stay with CLNS all day on game day, starting with the CLNS Media New England Patriots pregame show with Alex Barth a half hour before every game. Then you can catch the postgame show with Marvin Ezon and Mike Molino live after every single game on the CLNSmedia.com site. Subscribe to both on iTunes and Stitcher and YouTube now. Also get daily team updates on the Patriots Newsfeed podcast with Tyler Trudeau, also available on the CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show feed, available once again on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and the CLNS Media mobile app. Thanks again for downloading today's Patriots Beat. want to once again thank our terrific guest, the one and only Scott Zolak from 
the Patriots Radio Network, and of course the Zoe and Bertrand Show every day, every weekday, 10 to 2 on 98.5, the Sports Hub. You can follow him, of course, on Twitter at Scott Zolak. You can also give us a follow at Patriots underscore beat and at CLNS Media. You can also give my own personal account a follow at Trags, T-R-A-G-S. Today's sponsor was DraftKings. For Patriots content manager Michael Longhi, CLNS Media executive producer Larry H. Russell, the founder of the network Nick Gelso, thanks to everyone who tuned in. This is Mike Petralia, and this is the Patriots Beat Podcast, powered by CLNS Media. What's going on, Pass Nation? This is Marvin Zahn of the CLNS Media Network, and I'm here to tell you right now to check out the CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show hosted by myself and my co-host, Mr. Mike Nice. And live on CLNS Radio immediately after every single pass game, call in at 929-477-2386 toll-free to get your voice heard and contribute to the host breakdown and analysis of the latest Patriots contest. We also got the stars and sorries of the day, Twitter posts for the plays of the game, and everything else that is going on with the five-time Super Bowl champion. Subscribe to CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show on iTunes and Stitcher. And the best way, download the free CLNS Media Network mobile app for on-demand listening anytime, anyplace, anywhere.